In the last lecture, we ended with the topic on how to calculate the entropy of surroundings by using the entropy of the, the enthalpy of the system and temperature. So in this lecture, we'll continue that topic and let's try to solve a problem using that topic. So at 298 Kelvin, so the formation of ammonia has a negative delta, the entropy of the system. So N2 plus 3 H2 gives 2 NH3 and delta S of the system is negative 197 joule per Kelvin. So they are asking us to calculate delta S of the universe and state whether the reaction occurs spontaneously at this temperature. So for the reaction to have, notice that here, remember that for any spontaneous reaction, the idea is that delta S of the universe is always greater than zero. So the delta S of the surroundings, for this to be greater than zero, delta S of the surroundings must be more than greater than 197.197 joule per kilo. So to find delta S of the surroundings, we can calculate first delta S of the system. So we can calculate delta S of the system. So delta S of the surroundings is written as minus delta H of the system by T. So this delta H of the system is basically going to be the delta H of the reaction right here. So we know the formula for delta H of the reaction. So which is going to be sigma M delta H of the products minus sigma N delta H of the reactants. So here we have the reaction N2 plus 3H2 gives 2NH3. So from this we can write delta H of the reaction as the product is NH3. So how would you write delta H of the reaction? So you have 2 times the HF of NH3 minus of 1 times HF of N2 plus 3 times HF of H2. So these values can be found at the end of the textbook. You have tables, appendix tables at the end of the textbook. Use those tables and find out the values. So these are delta HF. So we call them the enthalpy of formation. So which which will become two times for NH3 it's minus 45.9 kilojoule per mole and for uh, N2 it is 0 plus 3 times H2 it is 0. So which gives you a value of minus 91.8 kilojoule. So this is the delta H of the reaction. So I already told you that delta H of the reaction is the enthalpy of the system. So which is going to be minus 91.8 kilojoule. So now we are finding delta S of the surroundings which is going to be minus delta H of the system by the temperature. In the problem the temperature at which we are operating is at 298 Kelvin. Remember the temperature should always be in Kelvin because T here represents absolute temperature. So minus of minus 91.8 times a thousand. So which means here we are converting it into joules over temperature of 298 Kelvin. So which when calculated gives you a value of uh, 308 joule per Kelvin. Now we know that delta S of the universe is delta S of the system plus delta S of the surroundings. So delta S of the system is minus 197 plus 308 which gives you a value of 111 joule per Kelvin so which is delta S of the universe so which is greater than 0. So when you have a delta S of the universe greater than 0 so you know your process is right. So even though delta S of the system is less than zero, delta S of the surroundings has managed to go beyond the system value to make sure that the, the total effect is still the same positive effect. 
So next let's talk about delta S and the equilibrium state. So for any process achieve, achieving equilibrium, delta S of the universe will always be greater than zero. At equilibrium, so there is no further net change and delta S of the system is balanced by delta S of the surroundings. So which means that here, delta S of the universe becomes equal to zero. So at equilibrium, any changes are balanced by one another. So which means that the delta S change in the universe is going to be equal to zero. So which means delta S of the system plus delta S of the surroundings equals zero. So which means delta S of the system equals negative delta S of the surroundings. So which means that here delta S of the system manages to negate the effect of delta S of the surroundings. So when a system reaches an equilibrium, neither the forward reaction or the reverse reaction is spontaneous. So there is no net reaction in either direction. So this is the idea behind delta S of the universe becoming equal to zero. So this represents that there is no net reaction at equilibrium. Okay. So now let's look at two ways in which uh, delta S of the universe can be positive even though the reactions are exothermic and endothermic. So let's take a look at an exothermic reaction where delta S of the system can be greater than zero and delta S of the surroundings is also greater than zero both increasing the actual value of delta S of the universe. Now this is an exothermic system where delta H of the system is still less than zero. Now the size of delta S of the surroundings is not important because delta S of the system is greater than uh, greater than zero. Now if the delta S of the system is greater than zero then delta S of the surroundings must be greater than delta S of the system. So remember this that if delta S of the system is greater than zero so delta S of the surroundings must be greater than delta S of the system so that the delta S of the universe will become greater than zero. So remember that this should always be positive. So for this to be always be positive so that means that one of them has to be greater than the other. So which results in the positive delta S of the universe. Let's look at an endothermic reaction. Most commonly in endothermic reactions delta S of the system is greater than delta S of the surroundings. The main reason is because the heat is being drawn from the surroundings into the system which results in uh, lesser entropy on the outside and greater entropy on the inside. But this is the idea behind for an endothermic reaction. How would the components uh, fare? Next let's talk about Gibbs free energy. So Gibbs free energy is the one quantity that can combine both enthalpy and entropy of the system. So given by G equals H minus Ts where H represents the enthalpy, S represents the entropy and T represents the absolute temperature. Now the free energy change is what we are looking for. So free energy change is given by delta G of the system equals delta H of the system minus T times delta S of the system. So this here is called as the formula for the free energy change. So it's a measure of the spontaneity of a process of the useful energy available from it. Now this delta G is a good measure because if delta G is greater than zero, there are three cases of delta G. Delta G greater than zero, delta G less than zero and delta G equals to zero. Because delta G itself can decide whether the system is spontaneous or non-spontaneous. If delta G is greater than zero, we call that a non-spontaneous process. If delta G is less than zero, we can say that the reaction is spontaneous and if the delta G is equal to zero, we can say that the system is at equilibrium and there is no net change in the forward or reverse reactions. So how would you calculate delta G of a reaction? So delta G of the reaction can be calculated using the Gibbs equation where we calculate delta H of the system and delta S of the system and individually then calculate delta S of the system or we can directly calculate by using the standard free energy formation which is delta G of the reaction is delta G of the products minus delta G of the reactants. Let's take an example here. So we have potassium chlorate, a common oxidizing agent in fireworks and match heads, undergoes a solid state depopulation re reaction when heated. So here we have 4 KClO3 gives 3 KClO4 plus KCl. So 4 KClO3 becomes 3 KClO4 plus KCl. 
So for this now, how would you write delta G of the reaction? So one way of doing it, we can write it as delta H of the reaction minus T times delta S of the reaction. So delta H of the reaction can be easily be calculated right here, which becomes sigma delta H of the products minus sigma delta H of the reactants. So which becomes three times delta HF of KCl of four plus one times delta HF of KCl minus four times delta HF of KClO3. So this when using the table, when you calculate delta H of the reaction, that gives you a final value of minus 144 kilojoules. So this is delta H of the reaction. Next we calculate delta S of the reaction the same way, where we calculate the product minus the reactant, which gives you a value of minus 36.8. So delta H of the reaction is equal to minus 144 kilojoule and delta S of the reaction is calculated as minus 36.8 joule per Kelvin. Now delta G of the reaction can be calculated as delta H of the reaction minus T times delta S of the reaction. So let's take back a look at the problem and look at the temperature. So the temperature is not specifically mentioned right here. So which means that here we will have to take in the normal temperature which is room temperature about 27 Kelvin. So 25 degrees centigrade. So let's take 25 degrees centigrade which is about 298 Kelvin. So which gives you minus 144 times 10 cube minus T becomes 298 Kelvin times delta S of the reaction is minus 36.8 Joule per Kelvin. So which when calculated gives you minus 133 triple zero Joule. So which gives you again finally 133 kilojoule. So notice that here that delta G here is less than zero so which means that the reaction is going to be spontaneous reaction so this is how we can check the system now you can take directly the delta g g values themselves which is g of the products minus delta g of the reactants and directly calculate it which also yields you the same answer now let's talk about delta g and useful work so delta g is the representation of the maximum useful work that can be done by a system during a spontaneous process at constant temperature and pressure. In practice, the maximum work is never done because free energy not used for work is generally lost to the surroundings as heat. So delta G is the minimum work that can that must be done to a system to make a non-spontaneous process occur at constant temperature and pressure. Remember that for a spontaneous process, it represents the maximum useful work and for a non-spontaneous process, it represents the minimum work that needs to be done for a system to become to make a non-spontaneous process and at equilibrium can no longer do any work. So let's take a look at the effect of temperature on the reaction spontaneity. Now let's take a look at two types of uh, two separate situations where we have a system that is spontaneous and non-spontaneous. Now the reactions that are spontaneous, so for a spontaneous reaction at all temperatures so if delta h is less than zero and delta s is greater than zero then we can say that at any t at any temperature delta g will be less than zero so if delta h is less than zero and delta s is greater than zero then the delta g value will always be less than zero now reaction is non-spontaneous when delta H is greater than zero and delta S is less than zero, then at any temperature, delta G will always be greater than zero. So this is the conditions for a spontaneous and a non-spontaneous reaction. For a spontaneous reaction, delta H is less than zero and delta S is greater than zero. 
and for a non spontaneous reaction delta h is greater than 0 and delta s is less than 0 so which yields the general conditions now when you increase the temperature what happens so reaction generally becomes spontaneous when you increase the temperature because as you increase the temperature if delta h is greater than 0 and delta s is greater than 0 so delta g value becomes more negative as the temperature increases now reaction becomes spontaneous as temperature decreases when if delta h is less than 0 and delta s is greater than 0 so which means delta g will become more negative and as the temperature decreases so let's take a look at all of these processes and let's take a look at both of the systems now so we have delta h and delta s so let's say we have delta h to be negative and delta s to be positive so if delta s is positive minus t delta s becomes negative so if delta h and delta s are both negative so this results in spontaneous reactions at all temperatures so which means delta g will also be negative now if delta h is positive and delta s is negative minus t delta s will become positive if both delta h and minus minus t delta s are positive then delta g becomes positive so which means that this is non spontaneous at all temperatures so if one is positive the next one is negative now if both delta h and delta s are positive what will happen here so minus t delta s will be negative but delta g can be either positive negative or positive now provided there is one situation that gives you the idea right here that there is it's spontaneous when you have high temperatures because at high temperatures the negative value will become larger which results in a more negative value it will be positive when so it will be non spontaneous at low temperatures at lower temperatures the negative t delta s becomes more negative so less negative so which means it results in a non spontaneous reactions at low temperatures now what if both are negative so if both are negative then minus t delta s will be positive now if delta h is negative and delta minus t delta s is positive it can be positive or negative so which results in an opposite situation right here so which means that this situation where you have minus t delta s which is positive so which means that it's spontaneous at low temperatures and non spontaneous at high temperatures so these are the conditions that we generally think about so these are the conditions that can be that we can think about for delta h and delta s so depending on the sign for delta h and delta s we can predict the nature of the reaction at different temperatures next take a look at this problem so the following spheres represent a familiar phase change for water where we are converting from water vapor to water so they are asking us what is the signs of delta h and delta s is for this process and they are asking us to explain and second is the process spontaneous at all temperatures no temperature low temperature or high temperature let's take a look at the system right here so this is converting from a gas to a liquid so which means that here it's a endothermic reaction it's an exothermic reaction so because it's an exothermic reaction delta h is less than 0 and it's also converting from a more freedom to a less freedom so which means that this results in a decrease of entropy so which means delta s is also going to be less than zero now we know that both delta h and delta s are negative so both delta h and delta s are both negative so which means that this reaction is going to be spontaneous at low temperatures and it's going to be non spontaneous at high temperatures so it's spontaneous at low temperatures and non spontaneous at high temperatures because remember that delta h is less than 0 and delta s is also not. the reason delta h is less than 0 because this is a condensation reaction which means it results in an exothermic reaction where there is a release of heat from the system into the surroundings and there is a, from a more freedom of system you have less freedom less freedom of motion so which results in a decrease in the entropy so next let's take a look at another problem 
A key step in the production of sulfuric acid is the oxidation of SO2 to SO3. So this is the reaction 2SO2 plus O2 gives you 2SO3. So at 298 Kelvin, they have given us delta G, delta H and delta S. So they are asking us use the data to decide if this reaction is spontaneous at 25 degrees centigrade and predict how delta G will change with increasing temperature. And B, assuming delta H and delta S are constant with increasing temperature and no phase change occurs, is the reaction spontaneous at 900 degrees centigrade. So let's write down the data that is given right here. So delta G is minus 141.6 kilojoule. Delta H is given as minus 198.4 kilojoule and delta S is given as minus 187.9 joule per kilo. So we have all the three values. They are asking us first to decide if the reaction is spontaneous at 25 degrees centigrade. Notice that delta G is calculated at 298 Kelvin. So which is basically 25 degrees centigrade. So the delta G value is less than zero. So which means that the reaction is spontaneous. Now they are asking us what will happen, how will delta G change with increasing temperature. So when you have delta H negative as well as delta S negative, what will happen when both are negative? So the reaction is spontaneous at low temperatures. So when you increase the temperature, so at higher temperatures, the reaction becomes non-spontaneous. The main reason is because delta S becomes more negative, which results in a delta, delta S becoming more negative. So delta S staying at negative, but resulting in minus T delta S becoming more positive. So the more positive this value, it means that it negates the effect of delta H resulting in a non-spontaneous reaction. Next, in the second one, they are asking us, uh, assuming delta H and delta S are constant with increasing temperature and no phase change occurs, is the reaction spontaneous at 900 degrees centigrade? So what we will do here is take the same delta H and delta S values and use it in the formula for delta G. So delta G becomes delta H minus T delta S which becomes minus 198.4 kilojoule minus temperature here is 900 degree centigrade. So which when done with Kelvin becomes 1173 Kelvin, 1173 times minus 187.9. So which when calculated gives you a delta G value of 22 kilojoule. So this is delta G which is greater than zero so which means this is gonna be non-spontaneous. So the reaction becomes non-spontaneous. So most reactions generally undergo what we call a crossover temperature. This crossover temperature happens so for example for a non-spontaneous reaction as you increase the temperature it crosses a, it touches a point called the crossover temperature where it converts from a non-spontaneous reaction into a spontaneous reaction. In the same way, for a spontaneous reaction as you decrease the temperature, the reaction also undergoes a crossover temperature where it undergoes a, becomes a non-spontaneous process. At this crossover temperature, we know that it achieves equilibrium. So which means delta H equals T delta S. So from this, we can calculate that crossover temperature as T equals delta H by delta S. This is the crossover temperature for any reaction to go from a spontaneous to a non-spontaneous reaction. So let's take an example. At 25 degrees centigrade, the reduction of copper 1 oxide is non-spontaneous with a delta G of 88.9 kilojoule. Calculate the temperature at which the reaction becomes spontaneous. So T again becomes delta H by delta S which is 58.1 over 0.165 kilojoule per Kelvin. So which gives you a final answer of 352 Kelvin. So at any temperature above 352, the reaction becomes spontaneous. 
remember here we are going from a non spontaneous reaction so which means non spontaneous reactions become spontaneous in the forward direction spontaneous reactions becomes non spontaneous in the reverse direction so next day let's take a look at delta g equilibrium and the reaction direction now a reaction generally proceeds spontaneously to the right if q is less than k so we know that q by k should be less than 1 so ln q by k should also be less than 0 so which means delta g should be less than 0 the reaction should proceed to the left when delta g is greater than 0 and q is greater than k so a reaction is at equilibrium when q equals k and delta g equals 0 now this is a good measure of the real relationship between delta g q and k so this real this relationship can be written as this way so delta g is proportional to ln of k so which means it can be written as rt ln q by k so where the proportionality becomes rt so when you split it further you can write it as rt ln q minus rt ln k so this looking at now if q and k are very different delta g where it has a very large value the reaction either releases or absorbs a large amount of free energy now if the q and k are nearly the same delta g will have a very small value and the reaction absorbs little amount of free energy so we use a standardized material standardized value for delta g we call it the delta g prime so delta g and the equilibrium constant can be used for standard state conditions where q equals 1 so in this condition when you put q equals 1 delta g becomes delta g prime it becomes minus rt ln k this is the formula that can be used to calculate the equilibrium constant for very uh, different processes so a small change in delta g causes a large change in k because of the algorithm logarithmic relationship so if delta g becomes more positive k will become smaller if delta g becomes more negative k will become larger so which tells you that uh, reactions that are generally forward reactions have a high are generally spontaneous and reverse reactions are generally non spontaneous so from that we can calculate delta g formula which can which can be written as delta g prime plus rt ln q for any condition so this is the formula for delta g so let's take a look at the formula right here so using appendix b find k at 298 kelvin for both of these reactions so we know the reaction that is given right here no plus half o2 gives no2 and so how would we write this right here so first we need to calculate delta g prime of the reaction so which can be written as sigma delta gf of the products minus sigma delta gf of the reactants so again we have no2 plus no plus half o2 gives you no2 so no2 which is going to be delta gf of no2 minus of delta gf of no plus half delta gf of o2 so which when calculated will give you a value of so delta g of no2 becomes 51 kilojoule per mole again remember that all these values are available at the end of the textbook in the appendix tables so delta gf of no becomes 86.6 plus half times delta g of o2 is 0 so 51 kilojoule per mole minus 86.6 so the delta g value becomes minus 36.6 Minus thirty six kilojoule per mole, which is the delta G value. So we know that the formula delta G equals minus R T L N K, and the temperature is there any temperature given on the problem? Remember the temperature is two ninety eight Kelvin. So minus R T minus eight point three one four times two ninety eight. times ln k so delta g value is minus 36 kilojoule so let's write it as minus 36 times 10 q so minus minus gone so we get ln k so which becomes 
over 8.314 times 298. So the LNK value becomes 14.53. So K, remember that LN is e to the power, so it's a natural logarithm, so e to the power 14.53. So when calculated, it gives you a value of 2.0 times 10 to the power 6. So K value for this reaction can be written as 2.0 times 10 to the power 6. Use the same principle now and try to solve this problem. Here they have given us the K value, they are asking you to calculate delta G. Again, use the same principle, delta G equals RT ln K, R is 8.314 and here T they have given as 298 Kelvin. You also, also already have k value, so use directly in substitute the k value and solve the problem for delta g and find delta g value. So when the k value is very small, there is essentially no forward reaction and reverse reaction generally goes to the completion as the delta g value becomes really large. And the same way, when the delta G value becomes really small and K value becomes really large, forward reaction goes to completion and essentially there is no reverse reaction. Now, when the K value is 1, so which gives you a delta G of 0, forward and re reverse reactions proceed to the same extent, so which gives you the understanding of forward and reverse reactions and their conditions. So, for the conditions for a forward reaction to occur, delta G must be much less than 0 and k value must be much greater than so k value must be large so this is an ideal condition for a forward reaction if delta g is much greater than zero and k value is really small so which results in a reverse reaction so this is the direction of reaction based on the delta g values so again Let's solve a problem where we have delta G at non-standard conditions. So they have given us the oxidation of SO2 is too slow at 298 Kelvin to be useful in the manufacture of sulfuric acid. So the reaction is run at high temperature. So 2 SO2 plus half O2 gives you 2 SO3. Now calculate the K at 298 Kelvin and uh, at 973 Kelvin. So they have given us delta G at 298 and delta using delta H and delta S values at 973 Kelvin and they have also given delta G at 973 for the reaction. So let's try and solve this problem here. So first they have given us 298 Kelvin. So we know, know that 298 is the standard temperature. So let's calculate delta G star at 298 Kelvin. So which is equal to RT ln K. So we have to calculate the K value at 298 Kelvin. So K becomes E to the power delta G over RT. So E to the power delta G at 298 is given in the problem is minus 141.6 times 10 cube over minus R here is 8.314 times 298. So that gives you a final answer of 57.2, so e to the power minus of, sorry, minus of, so which becomes e to the power 57.2, which gives you an answer of 7 times 10 to the power, so 10 to the power 24, so which is delta G at 298 Kelvin. Oh, sorry, this is the value of K. Uh, K at 290. Now we have to calculate the K value at 973 Kelvin. So again, using the same formula, so delta G at 973 Kelvin becomes minus RT ln K. Again, K becomes e to the power negative of delta g at 973 over rt which gives you e to the power negative so that value is minus 12.12 .12 times 
times 10 cube by 8.314 times 973 so which in the end gives you a value of 1.50 so which when calculated give you a value of 1.50 4.5 so this is the k value at 4.5 for 973 calculation Next, what is the second part given? So you have two containers that are filled with 0 0.500 atmosphere of SO2, 0 0.01 atmosphere of O2 and 0 0.100 atmosphere of SO3. One is kept at 25 degrees centigrade and the other is kept at 70 degree, 700 degrees centigrade. In which direction will the reaction proceed and reach the equilibrium at these temperatures? So for this, we need to calculate the Q values. So the reaction that is given right here is 2 SO2 plus O2 gives you 2 SO3. So for the Q value, we already know the formula. So it's product SO3 square, the pressure of SO3 square by the pressure of SO2 square times the pressure of O2. So pressure of SO3 right here in the problem is 0 0.1 and SO2 is 0 0.5 and S oxygen at 0 0.01. So 0 0.1 square over 0 0.05 square 0.5 square times the pressure of oxygen is 0.01 so Q when calculated gives you a value of 4 so this is at 25 degree centigrade so Q value is 4 and the K value at 25 degree centigrade we calculated this as 7 times 10 to the power 4 24 so Q is much less than K. So if Q is less than K, we know that Q by K is less than 1. So if Q by K is less than 1, so which results in delta G value. So if Q is less than K, what does that tell us? So which means that Q will proceed in the reaction to the direction in which the reaction will go forward. So let's take a look back at that. If Q is less than K, the reaction is spontaneously to the right. So it means that this is going to be spontaneous in the right direction, right side. And for the reaction, we can also calculate delta G from the formulas. So we know that delta G is delta G prime plus RT ln Q. So delta G prime at 25 degree centigrade, that was given as minus 141.6. So minus 141.6 plus R again 8.314 times T is 298 times ln of Q, the Q value is 4. So which when calculated will give you a final answer of minus 138.2. Minus. 138200 joule so which when becomes one minus 138.2 kilojoule so this is delta g at 298 kelvin now you can do the same thing at 700 degree centigrade the q value will not change so delta g becomes so delta g at 973 kelvin becomes delta g prime at 973 plus rt ln q so delta G prime at 973 in the problem is given as minus 12.12 .12 times 10 to the cube plus R again 8.314 times 973 times ln 4. So which when calculated will give you a final answer of minus 900 joule. So which can become minus 0 0.9 kilo joule. So this is the value of delta G at 973 Kelvin. So this is how we can calculate delta G, which is another the actual non-standard value of delta G. And we're using the delta G prime value. So remember the formula delta G equals 
delta g prime plus rt ln q so which gives you the understanding of how to calculate this values so with that we end the topic on thermodynamics and especially the topic on entropy free energy and the direction of chemical reactions so with that we end this lecture and i'll see you again in the next lecture